Hello, I'm Sean Murray, and this is The Conversation, where we take an alternative look at political events and current affairs through an Irish lens. In this show, we hope to pick, probe, investigate, and uncover the stories that you want to hear. We go where mainstream won't go. This week, we look at Ireland and its love affair with Europe. In this post-Brexit era, how has Britain's departure from the EU affected the relationship between Old Blighty and its closest neighbours? What is the future for the North of Ireland? My next guest is a former member of the European Parliament, a former political prisoner and current Sinn Féin politician. But before we speak to our next guest, let's get a quick overview on this week's topic. As always, we are joined by our resident co-presenter, Michelle Gildenew. Michelle is the current MP for Fermanagh South Tyrone. She has served in the Northern Ireland Assembly as a former Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development and chairperson of the Health Committee, amongst other things. Michelle has been a Sinn Féin activist since her teens and has been elected almost continuously since 1998. And today's guest is Martina Anderson. Martina is a woman well known not to mince her words on the political stage. A straight shooter, some would say. After serving 13 years as an IRA prisoner, Martina joined Sinn Féin, where she went on to become a member of the European Parliament. Martina Anderson, welcome to the show. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So, Martina, could you tell me about your childhood growing up in Derry? I would describe it as the child of the Battle of the Bogside. I lived in the row of houses, which has now got the iconic wall. You're now entering Free Derry. And by the age of seven, uh, 1969. There had been 14 union, unionist bombs planted, electricity stations, RTE, water installations, and there were six people killed. And I come from a family of 10, and my older brothers and sisters had taken to the streets for one man, one vote, for civil rights, basic houses, jobs, what people were looking for most modest demands, one might say, and they were beat off the streets, as we all know. And it used to be written on the walls across Derry and across the north that the IRA equaled I ran away. There was no defence. The community was crying out for people to protect us against a state that neither wanted or welcomed us. So I grew up knowing that there was something rotten at the core of, uh, of where I lived. I probably didn't have much of an understanding that it obviously was beyond, beyond Derry. It's a kind of environment that as a child I grew up in and all of that had happened before Bloody Sunday. And, and Martina, you, you, you then joined the IRA yourself and you were then captured in England. Can you tell me about your, 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 your capture and your, your time in jail there? Um, I'd previously been arrested in, in, um, in Derry and I was in Armagh during the, the second hunger strike when that started. So I got bail and um, I went on the run after 
10 or 11 months I attended every funeral of the hunger strikers that had taken place in 1981 and between that period and the period of my arrest um, we will remain blank. <laughs> I ended up, I was arrested in, in Scotland um, along with um, Ella Dwyer and three other comrades and we were charged, all of us were charged with conspiracy to cause explosions in England and Pat McGee was charged separately with the Brighton bombing. So the five of us um, ended up in Brixton prison. I was Ella and I were the only two women and 800 men. We didn't expect to be put on remand in Brixton Prison when we, when we rocked up that day and we were shouting goodbye to the others saying we'd see them in court. We expected to go to a women's prison in Holloway. But they, they said it wasn't secure enough for us and we ended up in Brixton Prison. Brixton Prison was a nightmare for 13 months. Um, Apart from the Category A prisoners, and I, I do have to differentiate because there were people that were from other backgrounds, you know, criminal backgrounds, who were Category A prisoners there. Um, but they were they were caring individuals in relation to two women being among eight hundred men. For some of the other um, criminal population, um, the it was appalling behaviour. So that was for 13 months of that. And then on top of it, uh, we were strip searched. It first of all began one or two a day and ended up at six strip searches every day. So it was a very invasive sexual environment, you know, um, that you felt that you were held within that both. And then as well as that, it didn't bother me as much the body searches. You were body searched at every move you made. Ella hated to touch in her body. I think because we were used to, and it shows you how you probably do get used to going through checkpoints and whatever and being searched. But Ella found that really offensive, how they, how they would search us. And so between the body searches and the strip searches and the sexual abuse, that we endured for 13 months. It was, it was near impossible to prepare for your trial because you're just trying to survive mentally. We knew that if we continued to react in the manner that we were acting, that's where it was going to lead. So we kept having to counsel ourselves, talk to ourselves, talk to each other and take it in the chin that this was it. And, uh, and we thought that was as bad as it was going to get until we were sentenced and we moved from the fire in the frying pan, because we moved from Brixton Prison into Durham Jail. And Martina, that sexual violence that you, you and Ella suffered in Brixton, um, it was bad enough what you suffered at the hands of other prisoners, but tell us a wee bit more about the strip searches. Would that have been one or two people carrying those out? Were there ever women involved in them? Or how many, how many people would have been involved in a strip search? And, what what was that like? You were put in the middle of a room and they circled you. How many? Six. Six screws. And they, they circled you. So when they circled you, they put you in the middle, um, like you were in a circus. Six of them. Six of them. And they would take off your clothes bit by bit. And they would make comments about your body. I remember one day I literally came off a visit I had that experience, put on my clothes and I got to the cell door and they put their hand up. They says, now we're just going to strip you again because we're now going to do this as a cell search. I literally hadn't left the room. Mm -hmm. So we knew that they were physically and mentally trying to break us. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't easy. You know, it wasn't an easy 13 months. It was a tough 13 months and when we got to Durham, that was our first experience when we walked in the door again, was to be strip searched. We were strip searched when we left Brixton, we were put into the back of a, a van, we had in contact with no, nobody but screws and we came into Durham and we were stripped again. So it continued throughout. Were other prisoners in Durham, were the other women prisoners strip searched or was that exclusive to you and Ella? Generally speaking, because we were 
what they regarded as high-risk category of prisoners. They subjected us to more strip searches than anyone uh, in the jail, either in Durham or in Brixton. Even the men were not getting the same treatment as we were. So there was a sexual connotation mm -hmm. attached to it because it wasn't just something that they were going to apply to category of prisoners regardless of if you were a male or female. So just moving forward a bit then, and then your, your eventual uh, release, Martina, you then joined Sinn Féin. Was that an easy transition after all those years in jail? Yeah, it was a natural transition. Uh, we, um, we had followed the political process throughout. Um, we were sent back here, transferred to prisons in Ireland six weeks before the first IRA cessation. I remember Martin had telling me that this was part of what the British were trying to do to send, send a signal. Um, we, had, we had historical meetings uh, with the NC, the South Africans came to Long Cash Prison and we women in Armagh were brought there. We were regularly updated about the peace and political process and what was going on in negotiations. As political prisoners, I was released under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement. My husband, who I married in jail, it's another story, um, he had subsequently uh, been released after me. Uh, Jack Straw tried to prevent him and two other men getting out because they were the only prisoners that were subjected to natural life. They were never to be released. And so the natural corollary of me was to become involved in, in, in Sinn Féin was it to be an elected rep? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, and I toiled with going back to university. I, well, going to university, I didn't have a university experience, but in prison I studied after having, we had a whole battle in our hands to get, be allowed to study and whatever, but I ended up getting a first class honours degree with an open university course. I went into jail with no academic qualifications and I come out with a number of A-levels and um, O-levels and then on to university degrees. When we had no notions of going down and embarking upon that road. I always had seen myself as an activist but very much as a non-elected activist um, until um, Mary Nillis had stood down and I was to replace her and I refused uh, to do so. I was at that stage, my position in the All-Ireland Coordinator, I was working on that. I had been working in the Assembly and then, and they used to slag me and say, I think I'm, she thinks she's Miss All-Ireland. I loved being in that position. And so I refused to go into the Assembly and then Mitch McLaughlin was moved into another constituency. And they asked me four times to stand and I, no, I was not doing it. And then Mark McGuinness came and asked me, we all know we don't say no to Martin. <laughs> and I worked with you and served alongside you in the assembly and um, you were you were brilliant and and so hard working and so um, across all the detail. But I thought you really shone when you went to Europe. You were a powerhouse in Europe and I've credited you with the reason that the Europeans knew so much about Ireland and the implications that Brexit would have. So tell us about your time as an MEP, will you? Um, Barbara de Bruyne stood down in 2012 unexpectedly and for personal reasons and I had been a junior minister to Martin McGuinness and one of the responsibilities that I had was Europe. So the party thought I knew a thing or two about Europe and so did I. But I had no intentions of ever going to Europe like to be an MEP so they asked me to take it on and again one thing and another you're persuaded to do it. So I goes over to Europe and I thought how am I going to make this place relevant to back here? So the first, the, you know, I, I, I became involved in it's a lot of jargon like rapporteur and all that there, you know, it's a lead MEP that's in charge of the files. So the tobacco product directive was something that I got my teeth into as one of the lead MEPs involved in that file. And it was how do I make, I always try to develop a model, you know, how do I make Europe relevant? So I bring you to Europe and Europe to you. And it was about the amount of people that was dying from and, the, and took on big tobacco, the big tobacco industry. They hated me. Um, I was literally, I went after them and everything that they had said and the lies that they had told about the product. If it was put in the market now, it wouldn't come on it because 50% of the people who use it die. 
So I did that and I got an experience with um, going to Palestine for the first time in 2013. And I suppose um, I would describe myself as a nationalist and, a, and an internationalist. And, you know, I, I don't think internationalism should be in any way like um, a buzzword or, you know, a book token. You know, I, I do believe it's the, it's, it's the fire that sort of connects community struggling um, for, for something better you know, across the world every day in every way. Coming from our experience of conflict in Ireland and going into Palestine to the apartheid wall, demolitions, all that was taking place and the deafening silence of the international community appalled me. And I had an opportunity in 2013 to, in Ramallah, to be, at, there was a tranche of prisoners being released. There was 26 prisoners being released and I stood to right into the middle of the morning, waiting on the prisoners to come out. I remember crying, you know, just watching their families and everybody just, you know, the, you know, just the emotion of it. So Thatcher's children, as I call them, the Tory party, was engaging in a conversation um, publicly about a referendum and pulling out of the EU. We knew that this was bigger than them claiming to just take back control. We knew that this was about our rights, our entitlements, and this was going to dismantle the Good Friday Agreement and elements of the Good Friday Agreement um, if this went ahead. So the referendum, there was the remain and the leave, and it was two sides of the same coin because it was the Conservatives fighting among themselves. And we didn't officially take part, as you know, in any of the official campaigns, but we had our own remain campaign. And we fought that here to explain to people why it was important that we be in the EU. We couldn't have some kind of a hokey cokey arrangement that part of Ireland was in the EU, part of Ireland would be out of the EU, that the Good Friday Agreement, strand two of the Good Friday Agreement, the all-Ireland element of it, about alignment across this island, the, the whole issue of the economy, the all-Ireland economy, could not operate as it had been designed to do in the Good Friday Agreement if we were out of the EU. And thankfully, in, in constituencies, after constituencies, we won the referendum in terms of not we, Sinn Féin, the people uh, that was involved, everyone in Remain. But we know that in Britain, in Britland, they decided in England that they wanted to leave and Scotland wanted to remain. So in Europe, after the referendum, the first thing happened was the first week there was the European Council and Enda Kenny went over to the European Council and he waxed lyrical about Scotland, how Scotland had had a referendum and how the British government had told them if they leave the UK that they wouldn't have a place in Europe and how Europe had said that. But he was Braveheart about Scotland and faint heart about Ireland. He never mentioned us. Now he was a Taoiseach going into a council meeting and MEP after MEP would come up to us and they asked us, time out of number, will there be another referendum in Scotland? Nobody was taking us on. They didn't give a fleeting glance, the British to this, and neither did it Europe because Europe didn't understand the Good Friday Agreement in any of its parts. So I was the chair, I was the head of the Sinn Féin delegation. And one night, uh, we knew we had to do something to try to be heard. And one night to an empty chamber, nobody in, Billy, no mates, myself and Matt Carthy sitting there, nobody else in the hall. And I get up and I used language that wasn't parliamentarian, as they would say, in terms of it should be used. Uh, but I told Theresa May that what she could do with her border and she could stick it where the sun doesn't shine that she wasn't putting it here. And I told the EU that what armoured cars and tanks and guns couldn't do here, that the EU wasn't going to be able to do to the border in Ireland because there are 310 crossings here. And if they thought that they were going to be able to put up what the Irish establishment started to present which was a Swiss border type arrangement. So they were saying, bring the border down south more, into the south more, but that's where the checks would be done. So they were proposing all of these other kind of arrangements. 
and we had developed a special status for the North to remain within the EU. I went to my bed that night, that was it, and woke the next day to Sinn Féin telling me, don't answer your calls to any of the media, the phone you <laughs> So I, was, I had speaking time the next morning again, and again it was about Brexit, so I went in and I remember my sister, she was scrubbing the floor, she sits in the house and she says Nolan was going berserk about what I had said the night before, I didn't know this, and she says the next thing Nolan said, oh she's on, she's on her feet again, let's go live, and she says your first words out of your mouth that morning was we didn't start the war, the war came to us, <laughs> and she said oh no, she's going to be in real baller now, um, so the next thing, across Europe, they all wanted to understand, you know, in France and Italy and Spain and Portugal and Germany, why was this Irish MEP standing up in the European Parliament saying that to a British Prime Minister? No, that's not what you sort of do. So we couldn't, we couldn't cope with the fact, I couldn't for the volume of bids that was coming at myself and Matt and I shared the, and we got to explain the peace process, got to explain the Good Friday Agreement got to explain the fact that you couldn't have the Swiss-style border, that the Irish was, you know, engaging people's brains on, that this might work, that you could have something similar here. Uh, that we are, we are in Ireland, an Ireland economy, with the Good Friday Agreement, strand two of the Good Friday Agreement, and bingo, they just went, Houston, we have a problem. This week, we take a look at Brexit. A concept presented with great hope for the British public, but what went wrong? Was this a major miscalculation on the part of patriotic politicians, or a more sinister attempt by a few to enrich themselves while making economic slaves of the working class for many years to come? In 2016, the UK voted to leave the EU, its closest and biggest trading partner, before officially leaving the trading bloc on the 31st of January 2020. During the referendum campaign, Vote Leave made a series of pledges about what would happen if Britain voted to quit the EU and negotiated a new relationship. After the Brexit process claimed two Prime Ministers, Vote Leave ended up running the UK government. Its figurehead, Boris Johnson, and his top advisor, Dominic Cummings, leading the charge for change. But what was promised and what was gained? If we look at some of the key promises, including trade deals, the NI border with Ireland, ending supremacy of EU law, taking control of the immigration issue and the 350 million promised to the NHS, we are only led to one conclusion. The British public have been had. A recent study by the London School of Economics found that Brexit was responsible for about a third of UK food price inflation since 2019, adding nearly 7 billion to Britain's grocery bill. Post-Brexit and the persistent poverty rate for the UK was 7.8%, the eighth lowest in the European Union and 3.5% points lower than the EU 28 average rate of 11.3%. All this while the wealth of the UK's billionaires has skyrocketed by over 1,000% between 1990 and 2022, ballooning by around 600 billion. The number of billionaires exploded from 15 in 1990 to 177 this year. Between 2020 and 2022 alone, billionaire wealth increased by almost 150 billion. While the working class pick up the pieces yet again, it seems that some have never had it better. You're still tuned into The Conversation, your weekly alternative probe of political events and current affairs through an Irish lens. I'm joined by my co-host, Michelle Gillardew, alongside our special guest, Sinn Féin politician, Martina Anderson. So Martina, it's difficult not to mention the current impasse at Stormont. Um, some parties have, have blamed Brexit and the disagreements around the protocol, but how do you see that stalemate? And how do you think Brexit has changed the political landscape here? Well, whilst Brexit has been an unmitigated disaster, um, the DUP's handling of it, I think, for their own constituency and from where they're coming at this from, um, in terms of wanting to maintain the union. Um, I think that they will go down in history as being the people that has successfully broke it up from inside out. Well, Martina, it's always good seeing you. We want to thank you for coming on the show uh, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you. And that does it for another week. 
We'd love for you to join the conversation by sharing the link to today's programme to help us grow our audience across all our social media platforms. I'd like to thank our special guest, Martina Anderson, and our resident co-host, Michelle Gilderview. In the meantime, the conversation will be back next week with more investigations and analysis. I'm Sean Murray. Bye for now.